This is one thing I can say with absolute confidence. Kevin at Epic Gardening does not have this tool in his back pocket. When we think of gardening in cold climates, we often think of the cold as our nemesis. But here are seven ways you can actually use the cold to your advantage to give you a leg up compared to those gardeners that don't get a single frost the entire year. If you don't know who I am, my name is Ashley. I have a bachelor's of science in soil science and I like to take said science and apply it to the garden in a very digestible, fun way. Now, if you like the idea of that, then be sure to hit that subscribe button to join the Geek Crew, where we do take the science into consideration, but we still do whatever the hell we want, which is how gardening should be. Number one is that the cold takes out pests and diseases. Freezing temperatures can and will knock out the eggs and adult versions of any sort of insect, regardless of even if it's made for our climate. And this is particularly true if you use the tips that I'm gonna tell you here in a little bit. Now, one hard freeze may damage, obviously, bugs and microscopic ones as well. However, a prolonged freeze can really clean stuff up. So before we jump into the rest of the seven ways in which you can use the cool climate to benefit us, let's talk about today's sponsor. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes with hundreds of genres. Since you are watching this channel, you probably like videos on gardening. Maybe you like it on sustainable living, maybe even botanical drawing. Ever want to improve your photography skills of your garden to record your gardens? progress and success over the years. Something, by the way, I wish I would have done more with my grandma. I would have loved to have documented more of her gardening, which obviously I didn't. So here's actually a course that I did do. It's called Indoor Gardening, Grow Houseplants, Veggies and Herbs. It's done by Ekta Chaudhry. And fun fact, she actually has a PhD in ecology. So you know the quality of the information you're getting is top notch. The first 500 people to use my link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen will receive one month free trial of Skillshare. Get started today. Huge shout out and thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video and supporting our community of cool climate gardeners. A lot of fungal diseases are not native to our cooler climates and they will overwinter if they're insulated or protected against the cold. But if we allow the cold to take it out, then the only way they can get back into your garden is actually via wind and insects and critters coming from the south upwards. One great example of this is actually downy mildew. You kind of see it on basil quite often. That is an example of something that moves its way up into Canada and northern U.S. isn't necessarily from here and our winters do take care of it. Now when it comes to plants and perennials, trees, that sort of thing, we can expose them to cooler temps and as long as it's within reason, we can get something called an acquired resistance, which essentially is your plant's ability to toughen itself up against pests, disease, that sort of thing via stressors such as the cold. So you may want to consider holding off on burlap sacks and actually mulching and that sort of thing for a small period of time. Let a few hard freezes hit without it being covered and then go in with some sort of protection for the remainder of the winter season. Stratification. So this is one that is quite often used with a number of different perennial plants and or some of, some of the more difficult, difficult known plants out there. So rosemary, lavender are probably two that are most common. Milkweed is another one, lupine, coneflower. So the best way to think about stratification is actually looking at the freeze thaw cycle. So when these seeds are exposed to cooler temperatures, it actually causes the outer layer of the seed to crack and it sends in a signal to the plant, letting it know it's officially time to germinate when things begin to warm up. So using stratification to our benefit can be hugely helpful. So what you may choose to do is actually sow some of your seeds now that would require that and are made for our zone. And for those more exotic ones, such as rosemary and or lavender, that sort of thing, what you may actually choose to do is winter sowing, which can be done later in the year, but still is playing off of those cooler temperatures to play in our benefit. This means no more putting plants in the fridge or the freezer or anything crazy like that because we have our own fridge and freezer for well over six months of the year. Not to mention the daytime light 
helps enormously with really good germination come springtime and or kind of that tail end of winter. And I've spoken about this before actually and putting a light inside of your fridge to help with this whole process. It's something that I've actually used, for example, winter wheat in a research scenario, but we did find it made a big difference when the wheat was exposed to varying levels of light. So complete darkness to some light via a grow light inside of the fridge. So we don't, we can skip all of that with winter sowing. If you've ever had a plant that's actually meant for our zone, such as a tulip that seems to never flower, the issue may be that it's not getting enough hours of cold. Think of it as similar to number of hours of light that a plant needs, but hours of cold. For example, fruit trees need cooler temperatures in the hundreds of hours. So if you've got tulips or zone three perennials that are planted in your garden, maybe next to a house surrounded by brick and or tons and tons of mulch, or you normally put tons and tons of snow on top, maybe actually pull back on that a little bit and expose those bulbs to a little bit more cool. Essentially what this is doing is like a spa day for plants, but a cool therapy one and the cooling process causes a lot of chemical reactions to take place because while it's taking well it seems like it's dead it's actually just taking a nap and recharging so there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we obviously are not seeing and if it can't gas up enough of those reactions those chemical reactions it has a more difficult time actually kicking off in the spring summer season. For all of you no-till people out there, we often hear that no-till is the way to go. And in some cases it definitely is, but we learn techniques such as cover cropping or cutting plants off at the base and leaving the roots in place, or maybe we're learning about aeration or a broad fork, something of that nature. But what if I told you freeze thaw cycles can be hugely beneficial in the actual tillage of the soil? And this is a documented thing. In several agricultural journals, it has been looked at and the top portion of your soil essentially gets tilled due to this freeze thaw cycle. So the best way to help with this is actually fracturing that soil surface, making sure there's no sort of crust or anything like that, and that the water can penetrate in some way, and then let mother nature do the rest of the hard work. Next up is snow as a protective insulator and actually a poor man's fertilizer. So snow, if you did not know, is water and air. That's what makes it such a good insulator. So if you've had issues with overwintering garlic or you've tried repeatedly to get carrots and beets to flower the following year so you can save seeds and it's never worked, or maybe simply you have bulbs and perennials that just tend to get winter kill like crazy, well, the solution actually may be not using the mulches, not using the burlap sacks, and using a ton of snow. The air inside of the snow is what helps with the process of insulating the plant, and it is something I swear by and I use on the regular. Now, the way in which it's a poor man's fertilizer is actually pretty interesting. I don't know if you knew this, but snow and rain actually capture nitrogen as it comes out of the air. 78% of what we breathe is not oxygen, it is nitrogen. So it makes sense that water can catch this on its way down. Now, what sets rain and snow apart is that snow is like a slow release version of this, whereas rain is like an automatic release version of this. And we know this through watching our gardens. After it rains, things just look a heck of a lot healthier and bigger and fuller. And it's because of this nitrogen. You can actually deposit anywhere from two to 12 pounds per acre, depending on the volume. Like I said though, snow is a slow release formula. So what you may wanna do in combination with insulating your plants by shoveling or snow blowing or doing whatever you want with that is actually to put it on your garden, put it on your lawn, put it on your soil because it is literal free fertilizer. And the more you accumulate, the closer to 12 pounds per acre nitrogen you can get. This next one is probably my favorite and one that is either really well known or not known at all. And I actually learned this one through my grandma, but the science holds true. Cold temperatures help make many crops tastier, sweeter, 
carrots into candy type scenarios. So a number of root vegetables, turnips, parsnips, carrots, beets, all when exposed to cooler temps become sweeter. And things above ground like Brussels sprouts or kale or cabbage also become tastier when they are hit with some cold. So rather than pulling everything out of the garden right now, what you may wanna do is actually leave things in place and watch the magic happen. I think you'd be quite impressed with how tasty it truly is. Not to mention, I do find that they store a lot better once they get hit with this cooler temps. And there's several Geek Crew people who had mentioned on a video earlier that they not only leave them in to get hit with cooler temps, they leave them into like well into December, which is quite interesting. So if you've got the climate for it, definitely execute it. Okay, so the next one is going to be hands down using the cold to take out problematic weeds, such as pigweed or crabgrass as an example. Purslane's another one, but purslane doesn't really bother me but it is another one that will take on, doesn't take on the cold very well. So essentially what you're gonna do is where you have these problematic areas is you are going to quite literally pull off the mulch, pull off the plant debris, similar to what we were talking about when we were talking about insects and disease and expose the soil to that cooler temp. It will damage the seeds beyond repair so that they don't germinate in the spring. Keep in mind, however, this will have similar effect to the beneficial guys as well. So your garlic and your milkweed and all these other seeds that you wanted to grow won't grow if they're exposed to too much cold in some cases. So use this with some caution, but if you have issues with crabgrass, for example, goodbye snow, hello, just bare ground. Now, if you've got a cover crop, for example, you can actually use winter kill as the way to get rid of said cover crop without mowing it down or having to spray it with some sort of organic or synthetic version of a pesticide or herbicide. So if you're doing the whole cover crop thing, let mother nature take care of the work and then leave that plant debris in place. So there you have it. Freezing can be a, a cold climate gardener's best friend. And not only that, but it's something that not everyone has access to. Let me know in the comments down below how cold your area gets and where you're from. I'd be curious to know how low your temperatures typically do dip and what you've tried in regards to trying to use the cold to benefit yourself.